Let's start with this first slide. I'm going to try to make this a little bit of interactive and then hopefully we'll come full circle. How many people here think we pay too much for bottled water? Just put your hand up. How many people think we pay too much for tap water? No one? Any hands? How many people don't know? How many think you pay too little? That's not the question. Too little? <laughs> so some people think we pay too much for bottled water. Not very many. Um, no one thinks that we pay too much for, for drinking water. So, questionnaire. When do you replace your vehicle? So for the students in place that don't have a brand new vehicle, say you went out and bought a brand new vehicle, how often would you go out and replace the vehicle? Every two years? Every five years? Ten years? Or greater than ten years? How many? What would you, th what would you think? Two-year cycle? Some people do that, trade it in every two years. Some people will do it five years, ten years. I'll run my vehicle as long as I can. But there's questions that we have to ask. Why do you upgrade the vehicle? Increase the level of service. Maybe it's not performing. It doesn't go as fast as, in the, as you want to down the 401. Maybe it's using too much gas. Maybe it doesn't provide the comfort level that you want to have or that you need. Or maybe it's a reliability issue. If you're driving on the 401 and using it for business all the time, you can't afford to be broken down or you just don't have any level of confidence in that vehicle anymore. So you say, I got to get rid of it. Safety it could be another issue with respect to it. Then there's an economic side. So there's a level of service side and there's a economics, the cost. Maybe your operation costs. It just costs you too darn much to put gas in it. Your brakes need to be fixed. You know the transmission is going to go. You know something's going to happen to it. And you base it on an economic decision. Or you want to minimize your replacement costs. You get rid of it in two years because it's got the most value at that time and you can get the maximum value for it. So you trade it in and get a new vehicle so you're not doing that stuff. And all assets depreciate, and you want to maximize that, that part of it. So why am I doing this? Well, the reason for buried infrastructure is no different than replacing your vehicle uh, with respect to it. So we have a design life or service life that that asset or that vehicle is established for. All cars have a design life or a service life. How do we estimate what the service life of a vehicle is? How long is it? Anybody? 10 years? Wow. So, yeah. Is it 10 to 20 years or is it less? So, if you look at warranties, two years, 60,000 kilometers. Why do they establish those values? That gives you an idea that they will guarantee performance for two years and then get the maximum value that they can for resale for 60,000 kilometers. So, there's both. If you look at warranties for a vehicle, two years, 80,000 kilometers. With the Japanese, they started to push it to 110, 120 for transmission. So you can tell the reliability of the vehicles based on their service life, based on what they're willing to bet with respect to risk. All municipal water, water, sewer distribution have a design life. Everything has a design life. The question is not if it will fail, the question is, when will it fail? So keep this in mind. We do these asset management ideas for our cars and our infrastructure every day, but we've had these pipes and these systems that were buried out of mind and out of sight with respect to it. So I want to get a pulse of where everybody is in the audience. So we're going to do a little bit of water survey. Get your feedback. I'm going to ask you some questions. Put your hands up. I've got someone tallying relatively percentages for each of these questions. And at the end of it, we're going to come back and ask these same questions and then we'll see if perceptions changed at all. What is a water pipe design life? 20 years? 50 years? 75 years? 100 years? 200 years? Is this a pipe in the ground or 
Pipe in the ground. Pipe in the ground. Pipe that distributes the water to your house that you're going to get your water out of your tap. The one from the street to your house or the one in the main one in the street? Main one in the street. Same one? Your house? Doesn't care. What is the design life? How many people? 20 years. No, no, no. Two? Two at 20. 50 years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve people. Thirteen. Whoops, sorry. Seventy-five years. One, two, hundred years. One, two, two hundred years. Okay. What do you drink at home? Bottled water or tap water? Let's do this first one. How many people drink bottled water at home? Nobody. <laughs> awesome. One, one. So, everybody drinks tap water. Awesome. What's the best quality water? Tap water or bottled water? How many people think tap water is the best quality water? One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen people. So we'll assume everybody else is in the other camp. Bottled water? There's only two choices. And I think there's about twenty some twenty-five people, so that's about ten. Rainwater? Can't drink it. Here's a good question. Why were water distribution networks constructed? To provide drinking water, option number one. To put out fires, option number two. For internal plumbing, to get water to wash your dishes and to flush your toilets. We'll put that one in. To cool off in a long shower. Oh, sorry. So, How many people think is number one? One, two, three, four, five, six. How many think is number two to put out fires? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many think it's for internal plumbing use? One, two, three, four, five, six. And who thinks you need to cool off in a long shower? That was a test, survey test. Are 1,800 installed water pipes still in service? Yes, how many people say yes? One. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Now, if you answered that question and you said the design life was 20 years, there's a contradiction. <laughs> if you said the design life was 50 years, how old is a pipe that was installed in the 1800s? About 150 years old? Water distribution systems were started around 1870. So it's 150 some years. What costs more? Bottled water or tap water? How many people think bottled water costs more? Person pay it. There's also the cost of marketing in there. Because companies, bottled water is 99.9% marketing. So? The cost, the cost that you actually physically pay is what I'm worried about, right? So what, so how many people think tap water costs more? One? Okay, so what's the cost of bottled water? It's about a dollar to two dollars for a 500 milliliter bottle, depending where you buy it. If you buy it in a grocery store, you, the vending machine, you're going to pay between that. That's about two to four dollars per liter. Or two thousand to four thousand dollars for a thousand liters cubic meter. And if you drink two liters a day, it's going to cost you somewhere between seven hundred to two thousand dollars for that drinking water that you're going to pay for. You can probably drop the cost by using bigger bottles, but there's still a cost somewhere around that price. Now, if you go to the university, or not the university, go to the city of Waterloo site, cost of water for a cubic meter, 
thousand liters is a dollar forty-eight. A thousand liters is a dollar forty-eight. That's the cost that you pay for the water. So bottled water is two thousand to four thousand dollars, and that same amount of water cost me a dollar forty-eight. Bottled water costs a lot more, right? I can take this bottle at a dollar and fill it up 1,351 times for a dollar 48 out of the tap. 1,351. We're paying nothing for the tap water. Right? So, bottled water uses twice as much water. They have to rinse all these bottles out. So if you get 500 mils, they've used 500 and poured it down the sink in order to get it out. So there's huge waste associated with it. There's huge transportation costs and emissions. And there's transportation costs with respect to getting it to your tap. You have to pump the water up the column. You have to pump it through the pipes. There's an energy cost associated with that, associated with that stuff. So there is some. Um, but, and not all plastic bottles are recycled. So there's environmental and social costs associated with both, but I would argue that there's a lot more environmental and social costs with respect to bottled water associated with it. If you say qu water quality in Ontario, if you look at bottled water, um, it can contain many things. They have drinking different regulation standards for bottled water than they do for drinking water associated with it. Only water labeled spring and mineral water are subject to higher quality standards. Associate it with it. Tap water exceeds the Ministry of Ontario Regulation Environments and Healthcare Canada associations. If you look at the major suppliers of water, one is by Coke and the other one's by Pepsi. This is where they get the water from that you buy in the bottle for $1.50. It's tap water from Calgary or Brampton or tap water from Vancouver or Mississauga. Unless it says spring water, special regulation. So you're paying a lot of money for that same water associated with it. If you look at regulations, Food and Drug Act looks after this one, bottled water, and they're only required to test their plant once a week associated with it. Tap water is tested daily throughout the plants and the regulation and hourly through the things. So totally different regulations in the stuff. Um, but both are safe. I have no problem in qualms of drinking bottled water. I, you know, if it sat out in a hot, in the car for two weeks, especially in the last two weeks, I may be concerned about it, um, associated with it. And there's been different studies and you have to be careful in the resources and the stuff, but both are safe. Now, do we pay enough for tap water? So that's what I'm going to go through. I'm going to focus most of the time on the municipal water systems, and we're going to have to do some definitions. Water is pumped out of a well. It's treated. So it's treated surface or groundwater. It's pumped through a series of pipes, linear distribution pipes, and it comes out your taps, and then we dirty it, and we magically flows down another series of pipes and goes down through the wastewater collection system goes to the water treatment plant. The stuff that I work in is this stuff. The often forgotten and part. We can have beautiful clean water at the treatment plant and if it goes through a whole bunch of crappy pipes it's not clean when it comes out the other end. And we have to put in a lot of chlorine, residuals and all this other impact in order to make sure that it comes out at the tap at a high level. So the most stuff that I'm going to focus on is talking about this stuff, which is the water distribution side. So where do water assets fit in with city-owned assets? City owns many different types of infrastructure assets, and we seem to focus on some. So here's some data from the city of Cambridge. All their assets for Cambridge that they own and they run, and the value of their total assets and their typical life, design life, or the typical life that they have. They've got dams, culverts, bridges, roads, and sidewalks. And if you look at the sewer systems, they've got 400 kilometers of sewer pipe. They've got 320 kilometers of storm sewer pipes and 490 kilometers of water pipes. 
So look at this, 480 of sewer, 490, so they're basically twice as long for every length of sewer, there's a length of water main sitting beside it. Typical age, 65 to 100, and the total asset values that they have on the books is this number, which is a big number in the city of Cambridge. If we take these out as percentages, Roads are 30% of their total asset value. We spend more time and more money on road maintenance and road repair programs for 30% of the total assets. The water pipes and the distribution pipes are 50% of the total asset values. Stuff that we've forgotten and left out of sight and out of mind associated with it. Water distribution systems and infrastructure assets includes the wells and the surface water, the treatment plants, the pumps and the reservoirs in order to be able to get the stuff out to our pipes, transmission and distribution pipes, valves and hydrants, service connections to the businesses' houses. So this is all the infrastructure that we have to manage in order to be able to do this stuff. If we look at water main construction materials, we got wood, cast iron, ductile iron, copper, asbestos cement, high density polyethylene, reinforced concrete, polyvinyl, PVC pipe. We've got a mix mash of materials and the stuff associated with it. And we've got wood stave pipes that are still in service. Been in service for 100 years. St. John New Brunswick has it. They said, you know, broke uh, 50 years ago. They must not have fixed it right because it broke again. But it leaks associated with it. Here's a pipe taken from City of Hamilton. Made in 1870. Wasn't made in Canada, was actually made in Scotland and shipped over. These two pipe samples were taken. This one was taken underneath the street and this one was taken in a boulevard, not subjected to salt. This one is corroded and pitted. None of these pipes were actually leaking. Manufactured in Scotland, shipped over. Manufacturing of iron pipe didn't happen until about 1890 in the United States. These pipes are still in service today. Um, 1880s, water distribution systems were built in the city of Toronto and the main reason they were built was all the buildings were made out of wood and once a fire started it would take out whole blocks. So they actually built water drinking systems to put out fires. Design of water, of drinking water systems are still designed today based on fire flows. Fire flows control the design and the size of the pipes. The use of these systems for drinking water was an afterthought. It's not part of the design, it's an afterthought. Water distribution, design paradigm, designed to meet fire flows. They're high pressure systems, 80 to 120 PSI, North America, and they provide high quality safe drinking water by water, some water treatment. Compare that to the UK. UK systems are low pressure systems. You turn on a tap in the UK, it doesn't flow at the same velocity. They are small diameter systems and they have fire, different fire systems associated with it. They're designed to be consumption demand and low pressure. So they have totally different things. So let's go back to the city of Toronto and look at the infrastructure and the stuff that we've got. Design life on the books is 50 years. 50 years on the books in the city of Toronto. Water and system, sewer systems over 85 years old. If I've got a car that was designed for 50 years, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that at 85 you're going to have some problems with your car. Right? If you haven't done anything to it. This is typical of many, all cities in North America. So we've exceeded our design life associated with it. Remember that pipe that I showed you from 1880s? You sandblast that pipe, that is it. There was holes in the side of that pipe. The iron had turned to graphite. That pipe was not leaking. It was still in service. However, if you disturb that pipe or do anything to it, it will leak. That's a big transmission line associated with it. Interesting picture that I got from a guy, I can't remember who gave it to me, but this is in Prince Rupert, BC. It's an 18 inch steel unlined water main coming down from the mountains. Uh, age was 75 years, and this guy, George, walked that line every, from 1967 to 1920, or 1993, for 26 years, he walked that line and did an inspection on it. 
and he installed and repaired clamps with wooden pegs in order to think. And you can see his 26 years of work as he's fixing another leak. So that was doing an inspection and a rehab and a maintenance and operation on a water main that you can actually see associated with it. We've got water mains that are made out of concrete and brakes and these things corrode and they do fail, big transmission lines. And if we plot the number of brakes, this is actually data from the city of Waterloo, you'll see that the number of brakes increase exponentially with respect to times. There's a website, watermain.clock.com which I just clicked to, and this goes around, searches news articles in North America for any of the word water main break, and it tracks how many water main breaks, and you can see that so far there was 546. And this is the cost in order to fix water main repairs, and this is the total cost in corrosion. Now you have to be careful with this website, it's made by the PC, PC, PVC manufacturers selling, trying to sell plastic pipes but it's a great website with respect to articles and the stuff on the size and the scope of the problem with respect to um, infrastructure size. Oops. I did it again. I'm going to show you a series of slides what happens when a water main breaks. Watch this guy here. So this lady's driving in her car. Now she's surfing in her car. Look at the guy with the bag. Some people come over to help, not the guy with the bag. The driver's now exiting the vehicle. Now she's gone for a swim. The guy with the bag. The lady's now out. The guy with the bag. The lady's out. And there's the car. Now, I think there's. And there's the lady. Someplace in the US, but I can give you an article for that happened in Kitchener in 2007 where the exact same thing happened on uh, March break in Kitchener. These are not isolated events. Anybody hear about the recent water main breaks? One happened in Needle Hall, right beside Needles Hall. Shut down Needles Hall, there was another one. If you go to YouTube, on Saturday there was one in downtown in Waterloo. And they were driving through and they were using the call of the car wash. Um, these water main breaks are a sign of an aging, deteriorating system. Um, these are not uncommon with respect to the size of the infrastructure. So this is not an isolated event. Another problem is we get calcium or we get iron bacteria. These are actually iron bacteria that grow on the inside of the pipe and they can close it off. This pipe will provide drinking water, but it will not put out fire water. Now you've lost your diameter, so now you don't longer meet fire flow. It also reduces chlorine residuals, so we have to add a lot more chlorine to the water. All these water samples meet drinking water quality standards. These water samples were taken in the city of Waterloo. Every one of these meets the requirements. This one, can't see it, but there's little floaters and the stuff associated. We did a study with the city of Waterloo and their distribution network where they actually went out and got these water samples when there was a water dirty water complaint. Everyone met the guidelines. It's actually very um, useful. This is lift the nice tea on the other end. At the same time, my five year old son got up on Saturday morning went to the bathroom, flushed the toilet, and he says, Daddy, Daddy, the water's all brown. Now, even though I was involved, and I know all these things are safe drinking water, there was no way that we'd allow them, or I, even I would drink the water, even though that I knew these dirty water events, so with respect to quality and issue. So we look at, we've got old roads and old pipes, and we're gonna take a look at this guy in here, and we're gonna call this guy Jack. And Jack represents open cut construction. Jack was the guy that went in and dug the pits and laid these pipes in place a long time ago, open cut. Now we've got new roads over old pipes. So we've got these pipes underneath here, they deteriorate, they age, they break, and now we've got leaky distributions and who comes in to fix it? Jack. We have to dig up the roads and fix it, associated with it. 
Jack's been very busy. He's been putting in a lot of infrastructure underneath our roads and our road systems. And if you don't believe me, this is a picture of downtown New York. When the infrastructure, look at the buried infrastructure and the stuff that's in there associated with it. So Jack comes in and puts these things in many different times and in many different colors. Jack was in, he was in for gas, telephone, elect sewers, electric, and water services. All at different times with respect to the infrastructure problems, but not at the same time. And then we have to go out and find these water mains. And how do we find them? Well, we use a backhoe or we use a post hole. Look at this. What's this right here? Fire hydrant. They're putting in a hydro pole and they put it through the water main. We don't know where our assets are. We don't know what we've got and we also don't know often where they are. We're lucky some people don't get killed associated with it. So the, one of my hypotheses is we've got a complex problem is trying to fix and renew these old deteriorated water and wastewater systems. So the first question that often says, let's dig them up and replace them. I buy a new car. I get rid of my old one, I get a new one. So why not put in a new pipe? If they're 30, 40, 50 years old, let's do it. So let's look at the cost. City of Cambridge, 400 kilometers, 490 kilometers of water, 480 kilometers of sewer. At replacement cost is about $1,000 a meter to dig it up and replace it. And you're looking at 600 to 970 million dollars to replace all that distribution network. That's a lot of money. PSAB, oh, this is the replacement cost in here. Public Sector Accounting Board says we don't use our replacement cost, we use our depreciated cost. These are accountants talking, so when you buy an asset, it has a certain book value, what you paid for it, and then it depreciates over time. So we use historical costs, which are much lower, and if we use accounting, it's much lower, but the main thing that matters is what you need to do, it costs you to fix it and replace it today. These costs in Cambridge do not include the cost of the water and wastewater treatment plants and the transmission lines because they're paid by the region because the region supplies water to the cities, and lateral connections. If we use a 100 year service life and we've got 970 kilometers of pipe, that means we have to replace 9.7 kilometers every year to complete the network to keep it at 100 year life. You can imagine digging up 9.7 kilometers of road in the city of Cambridge every year. How much traffic? We don't have enough contractors in order to be able to do that. So we can only do about a couple kilometers a year. So this is not possible, even if we had all the money to do it, and it's going to cost us $9.7 million a year in order to replace all our infrastructure every year with something new. It's not possible. Huge social cost, environmental costs associated with it. So I contend that Jack needs to be banished or abolished, open cut, replacement. We've got to find other ways that, that are cheaper and better, less damage to pavements, less convenience to customers. Now there's a good news to this story, is that our old pipes that are 100 and 150 years old have performed extremely well. And they all don't need to be replaced. And we did some studies with the city of Niagara Falls, so we did condition assessment. Grade one is brand new pipe in new condition. Grade five is the pipe is going to collapse. And if we look at the worst case, 15% of the total network is really, really bad. 77% of the network is in amazing condition. So if it's 100, hasn't failed in the last 100 years, why will it fail in the next 100 years? So we've we got to worry about these types of pipes with respect to technologies. So the good news is we've got all kinds of new innovative technologies that we can either build a new pipe inside the old pipe or do assessments associated with it to rebuild these pipes. So I consider this open heart surgery. If we can make a small incision and not do all the damage and do this stuff, it's no different than having to cut yourself open in order to be able to do it. We can do it more cost effectively with less disruption. He's also much more environmentally friendly. We did a study for some people out in BC, and we showed that you can 90 to 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions just from the construction activities alone.
by going to less invasive, plus less description. So there's what's called trenchless construction methods. And these, by definition, is techniques for utility line installation, replacement, rehab, inspection, and leak detection with minimum excavation from the ground surface. So we don't need to make a hole and continuously dig along the streets to do it. We can do this microsurgery, or we can use lint locations that we've already got, and we can fix the infrastructure associated with it. Key points. Minimum surface excavations. Alternative open cut. So we can minimize the use of jack to small little locations. And we're talking about pipelines, typically less than 36 inches, 900 millimeters, something that people can't go in. So we've got all kinds of innovative technology. Some of them have been invented in Canada, some of them invented in the UK where we can actually go in and pinpoint leaks in water distribution systems. We can have all kinds of innovative technologies to clean the pipes. Many of these pipes have been in service for 100 years and never been cleaned. Imagine a car for 100 years that's never been cleaned. My car looks pretty bad after a month of never being cleaned. So we've got drag scrapers. We're working with a technology company out of Bracebridge, Ontario. That's, it's got an innovative way of blowing rocks through these pipes to clean them and clean them much faster. Once we got them cleaned, we can put a new lining on the inside of them. We can put cement on the inside of these old pipes. That stops the corrosion products and the stuff. If the pipes have good structural strengths, why dig it up and replace it if it can carry more flow and last for another 100 years? We can apply new products. There's new spray in place products, new po polymers and uh, epoxies and stuff that we can spray on the inside of these pipes to rebuild a new pipe on the inside of these pipes. So we can go from this back to this and get our fire flows and extend the life of those assets at a fraction of the cost of digging them up and replacing them. Whoops. We've got new innovative lining technologies where we can take a pipe that was manufactured in a plant, fold it, put it in place, expand it, and put it in. Linings. And when, here's an innovative technology developed out of Quebec where we can take a, basically a sock or some type of fabric, impregnate with some kind of resin, cure, pull, pull it in place, and form a new pipe inside the old pipe, using the old pipe as a form. So we don't have to dig it up to build a new pipe. And this is equivalent to a new pipe. Innovative technologies that are being pioneered in Canada and, and, and exported to the US. So we just do these small access ways, stuff associated with it. What's the potential cost savings? Open cut is $1,000 per meter. Cost for renovation for 400 kilometers is $400 million. If we apply non-structural polymer structural lining, that costs about 100 to 150. So we're gonna, our cost savings could be 360 to $340 million. Huge cost savings. We can do a lot more work for less. And we've got a variety of other techniques associated with it, not including social and environmental costs, which is really the triple bottom line. If we look at the management cycle with respect to any infrastructure asset, we install, acquire, we operate, we maintain and inspect, eventually we repair, we renovate, and we replace. And it takes money to renovate, it takes money to inspect, and it takes money to replace. In the buried infrastructure side, we're here. We're just starting to inspect in this stuff. We're starting just to get to this part of renovating the, and repair these assets. Here's a clip from I've taken from St. John, New Brunswick. St. John was a, the first incorporated city in Canada, 1912. And here's an article, headline of the, of the paper. A $200 million pipe dream, replacing the old buried water system is key to St. John's future but is the public willing to pay? How do we do that? Associate it with it. So there's the old infrastructure that was installed, still performing today. If you look at the problem with respect to buried infrastructure, we need money in order to be able to fix it. Recent RBC survey said $80 billion in Ontario alone is required to fix our buried infrastructure problem. 80 billion. 80 billion. If you look at all the infrastructure deficits, 
they're growing. We're falling behind associated with it. And we've got no or limited funds in order to do the tech capital work programs and the stuff that we have or to remove this backlog. And that backlog in the infrastructure is not to make it better, it's just to get it up to an acceptable level of performance, that 80 billion associated with it. So what's the problem? Well, governments in the past, or water utilities in the past, have relied on governments to come up with programs to allow them to do their capital works. They're not full cost recovery. Government short programs are band-aid, short-term band-aid solutions. They're one-offs. Uh, they don't drive financial sustainability, and there's a need for long-term funding associated with it. Recent changes in regulations have forced water utilities now to be self-sustainable. Self-sustainable means, anybody? What would a water utility mean self-sustainable? Income matches your costs. That's right. Revenues must equal your expenses. On a yearly basis or what? Continuously. Continuously. How long are we going to be using our water and wastewater systems in our houses? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 100 years? For until we come up with some new innovative technologies, we'll need it. So what these things have forced water utilities to become a little bit more accountable. Oh, we now know what we have, where it is, what it's worth, and what condition it is in. Starts with it. So where does the money come to replace these infrastructure assets? Think of it this way. If you've got one car, it's an easy tool to manage. If I got two cars, I'm a little bit more complicated, but it's not hard. Think of a pipe and a valve and a system as a car. A city has thousands of cars. You can't go out and replace a thousand vehicles. The cost of managing and operating all that stuff is a huge problem and a complex problem. So how do we get rid of this backlog? So, that's driven to part of our research in the area of buried infrastructure asset management, which I call the new frontier. I was going to put a picture of Star Trek in here, but I forgot. The enterprise, the new frontier. What is asset management? It includes all the activities and planning of programs, design, construction, maintenance, rehabilitation, and financing of where, how we get the money in order to be able to, do, to fix the problem of the things. So this is a picture, a top-down picture of the problem that we're going to look at. This is the city. We've got a huge number of assets that we have to manage we don't, with limited financial resources. So we call strategic asset management. How do you manage all the pipes in the distribution system and project into the future to make sure that we're sustainable? Revenue meets expenses. What are our costs in 20, 30, 40, 50 years? So this is one management. We need management plans for 20 to 100 years. We need to look out into the future to say what's going to happen. Once we do that, we also got to be able to build work programs and do on the tactical management plan on the two to 10 year plans. Just like financing and businesses have short term goals. Eventually, we got to be able to do capital works on, say, this street, the water main needs to be replaced. It's too small. It's too corroded, we got to dig it up and replace it, or we got to build our infrastructure capital programs for this year and next year so that where the work gets done. Totally different levels and scales associated with this stuff. So let's, current asset management. Talk about a water utility looks after the water mains and the sewer pipes and the distribution system, and we'll call that the physical infrastructure system. These are the pipes, the valves, and all that stuff. We, there's a finance sector. We collect user fees. That user fee has revenue and has expenditures to run this system. If you got no money, you can't do all the works and stuff that you need to do. So there's obviously connections between how much money and your revenues and your expenditures and what you need to do in your system. There's also what we call the consumer and political sector. There is service level satisfaction. If I'm getting dirty brown water at my tap, I'm not going to be happy and I'm going to complain to my politicians and that's going to help hopefully drive up rates and force people to do things. So there's a connection between this sector and this sector. There's a sector that if my water utility rates go up and my water rates continue to go, 
then I will actually start to use less water because I'm going to need to save money. No different than if gas prices increase by threefold, if you've got a big gas guzzler, you're going to sell that car and thing. So there's a connection between consumption and what you can do in here. And there's also an impact between consumption and this sector and this finance sector. An example would be, if I go to low flush toilets and water conservation programs, and I'm using less water, which we all hear about, let's take this to the extreme. What happens? How do I get revenue from a water utility? I get paid for water use. If I reduce the amount of water that's being used, I reduce my revenue. So there's a connection between this sector and this sector associated with it. So water utilities are a complex problem. You're not supposed to read this slide. Don't worry about it, read in the detail. Everywhere you see is a plus, something's being added, and every place you see a minus, something's being subtracted. All kinds of complex interconnections, so if you change one thing, that change percolates, goes all through this system, and you just can't build a simple spreadsheet in order to be able to solve this problem associated with it. So we've used complex systems theory in order to model some of the infrastructure changes in the water infrastructure. A complex system is something that's counterintuitive. You change and you say, I'm going to reduce low flush toilets, I'm going to introduce all this thing, all of a sudden water utilities are going, oh no, we don't have the same revenue, now we're going to jack up rates to cover our shortfall in the infrastructure because they didn't understand that connection at the time. System resist policy changes. You need to increase rates. If you keep on increasing rates and performance doesn't change, guess what? People are going to get ticked off. They're going to talk to their politicians and the politicians are going to campaign on the next thing that we're not going to raise your water utility rates. So everything that needs to be really done gets counteracted or defeated externally. If you've got this problem, you've got a complex system. And if it takes long run responses that are contrary to short term, Things that need to be done by politicians in the short term are opposite what needs to be done in the long term by somebody, and you've got this competing interest, then you've got a complex system. So our research goal is to use systems dynamics to do um, asset management, to develop an asset management system so that we can find optimum strategies and financing with respect to these over the long term. And we're talking 50 to 100 years because these assets are going to be in place for 50 to 100 years associated with it. So we published this paper last year with a PhD student that, that talks about some of the stuff. And we've been working with research partners, the City of Waterloo, City of Cambridge, and City of Niagara Falls, and, and CAT associated with it. And what we've done is we've built a complex model that takes into many of these considerations at different levels associated with it. Just to give you an idea, of the value of someone running these models and the value of it. Case number one is do nothing approach to manage an, uh, a water utility. Case number two is we're going to re re replace 1% per year, which means a 100 year design life. And then we cut, we said, okay, let's get the design life down to about 80 years instead of 100 years. We ran different scenarios with no price elasticity and price elasticity. Price elasticity is just a fancy word saying if the price goes up, consumers are going to use less. If price of gas goes up, triples, you'll, you'll, you'll eventually cut. So we can put water demand in here and see the impact on these relationships. So do nothing, which is what we've been doing for the last 100 years. Replace at a 100 year life, service life, versus an 80 year life. Average age of the network in 100 years goes to 97 from 56. So performance goes down. And even though we do these ones, we maintain an average life of 60 years, 50 to 60 years, based on how much we rehab. The total expenditure of the network, doing nothing at 100 years costs you more than doing rehab and doing capital works. It's counterintuitive. Costs you more to run the network doing nothing than it is. And if you do more work, you really don't save anything in today's dollars. And if you look at the rates that need, make, need to make this thing sustainable, uh, we started at $3.75 and 
as our unit cost per cubic meter of water. And, we've re and if we take in price elasticity in order to balance the books, and doing nothing costs $7.60 versus rehabbing and putting in capital works, we can charge $5. $2 a difference a cubic meter by putting in capital works programs in order to get rid of our infrastructure backlog. Huge impacts associated with it. So what we found out, borrowing for capital works can get rid of the backlog of the infrastructure in 15 to 40 years. So we have a solution to the problem associated with it. Interest cost on fixing this stuff is extremely small. It doesn't even show up as a, comes out as a decimal place in the total network asset value. That's again, con con contradictory. And the interest costs are offset by operational energy savings. Operational costs are two thirds of the total cost of running a network. And if we can fix our pipes, make them cleaner and smoother to pump these things, we'll save 30%. We can take huge energy savings and huge operational savings because we can reduce chlorine residual levels and we've got a much net better working network. So the last slide, and then we'll go back to the survey, is I have a dream, Jack. Jack for well water, well managed water systems. Jack says I want safe and reliable water, and then Jack says I'm, he's retired, enjoying life on the beach with good quality water. So that's Jack's dreams. So let's go back to the water survey and see if how how we've done and see if there's any change. What is the water pipe design life? Fifty. Where? City of Toronto, 50 years. If you look at typical values assigned, 75 years, number pulled out of the hat. Another way we can find out our, our, our design life of the system is when they, is you look at how much pipe is replaced each year and you know the total amount of pipe. Prior in the UK, before they privatized, it was estimated at about 100 years, 150 years. They got to 150 years with their system, so they made it 200 years. When they privatized, now it's gone over to somewhere around 1,500 years. It'd take them 1,500 years to replace all the stuff. So the truth is somewhere in between the two. Um, but we're going to have these assets for a long, long time. Well, what do you drink at home? Everybody, we know the answer to that one. What's the best water quality? Which one's tested regularly, daily, and hourly? Tap water. Highest quality of water we have is tap water. Associated with it. Um, why were drinking water networks in North America constructed? To put out fires. Still designed to put out fires. Um, in the eight, our 1800 pipes still in service? Definitely. 1870 in the city of Hamilton. St. John New Brunswick's got wood stave pipes that have been in there for years, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They still work, they're still performing. So, let's go back to the last question. Do we pay too much for tap water? Do we pay too much? Are you paying too much for tap water? Pay we pay too little. We pay, do you pay too much for bottled water? Definitely. So even if we raise the cost and we double the cost of tap water, so our bills go from 20 or $30, who cares if I can fill this bottle, remember 1,351 times, even if I can fill this 650 times, half of what I had before, I still got a good deal. Water utility rates need to increase at a rate of about eight, somewhere between eight and 10% per annum every year. Now the good news is, some of the modeling stuff we showed, is the impact on the consumer is going to be around consumer price index. Why would that be? Some costs will be fixed, but the biggest thing is people will start to conserve water. Canada are the biggest water hogs. We use more water per capita than anybody else. So we're using about 340 liters per capita per day per person, and that can go down to somewhere around 200 when you look what they're using in Australia and the other places. Um, even in the modeling and the stuff that we've done, we're not even getting close to even, we're, 
there's still lots of slack in the system. New technologies will be developed, innovative plans will be developed, but we do have a solution. Open for questions. Anybody got questions? Yeah. How would you repair a pipe? Like, is the technology there to repair the pipe? Like, you show pictures where they line it and they pull stuff through and everything. And I've seen that being done, actually. And it always seems to be pipes that are pretty good but a bit rough on side. But they actually have pits in them in a few spots, but otherwise, not too bad. You see they're very localized. And corrosion, I had to take material science, too. Yeah. Right? In, that, uh, in, in that era, the idea was corrosion had to, like, it always occurred electrochemically. Still yeah. So you get a corrosion cell. Can you, can you actually fix that and fix it reliably? I'm not going in and doing a spot repair. Hardest part in the water distribution side is we have no technologies today to even rate and evaluate the condition of water distribution side. We've got no standardized condition rating system. That's the state of the art. We have got no condition, while we got condition technologies, we can find leaks, but we've got no reliable method to find out what condition of those pipes and where those things are. We can put a pig on the inside of a water distribution line and use some of the stuff that they've got in the oil industry, but it's too costly. You might as well dig it up and replace it because your inspection costs are too high and reliability of it. So we're not going to go in and fix and find out where those exact corrosion places are. But I can build a new, if I can build a new pipe on the inside of that, then I don't care. The rest of the whole pipe can go. It's a standalone self-system. So it's equivalent to a brand new pipe on the inside. Do we have the technology to do that? Yes, we do. Do we have design methodologies that are evaluated and, and standardized at, in the water distribution side? No. Material performance? Um, Tons of research and tons of work needs to be done in, in, in the water side. Wastewater sector, pretty straightforward. Water distribution sector, very complex. Even designing the equations and the mechanics of the materials and that stuff. They've got these high build spray on epoxies or polyurethanes that we can now spray inside so we don't have to put all that thing. We can spray this thing a couple times and go through the pipe and we can build a structural pipe on the inside of it. Pretty cool. And we can do that at half the cost of digging up and replacing it. Even better. Is there any technology that's fast enough that you can take a pipe out of service, fix it quickly, and then put it in service without having to put all those complicated yes. temporary pipes on the road, those blue pipes that they yeah. have? Temporary bypass systems. Uh, with current drinking water standards, uh, you have to do that, and with these older technologies, you have to put out a bypass system. So we, we, we put out all that blue pipe in the street, and yes, they have to leak. They have to be spilling water out, because you, you don't want contaminants in the stuff. A third of the construction cost is that blue pipe sitting out on the road. A third, 30% of the total construction cost. With these new technologies and spray on place, building pipes, we can now build it have them back in service the next day. Um, you won't be able to drink it with the existing guidelines, but you'll be able to shower with it. And then after two or three days of getting the test results back and show that it's clean, you can put it back in. But they're using the exact same procedures as they do for an emergency repair. If a water main breaks like it did last Saturday, they go down, they fix it, they don't shut down the whole system. They do a shock chlorination, they isolate, and then they put it back in. So, yeah, we can. Then, what happens, we drive the cost even down farther because now we've taken out 30% of the cost associated with putting out that bypass with these new technologies. We're working with partners in order to look at these new technologies and spray in place. Uh, City of Cambridge is doing a pilot this year. Uh, City of London's doing a pilot um, with, with uh, 3M and one of their products. What's the warranty on this? What's the warranty? Oh, that's, 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 that's another debate. The manufacturer. Well, when you're putting in new products that are cheaper and, you're not, and you don't have a, what, how do you determine a 100-year service? Then you're going to put the cost out. If you put the cost out so high, then people will say dig it up and replace it. 
Um, what's, what's, the, what's the service life of a plastic pipe? We know that a metal pipe has a service life of 100 years or 200 years because they've been in service for 200 years. Um, sometimes we create our own problems. The old 1880 pipes are better than the 1960s ductile iron pipes. You used to put bitumen on the inside of drinking water pipes. So some cities in the world are losing enormous amounts of water to their leaking pipes. Yeah. What are the methods to find out where the pipes are leaking so we can put in liners or where? Well, there's a technology that I showed you called Sahara that was developed in the UK based on research funding through the Water Research Council. Um, that technology was, is in Canada, it's pretty expensive. There's a technology developed um, at National Research Council um, that spun off a company called Ecologics, where they basically put a, um, um, a microphone on a fire hydrant and a microphone on another fire hydrant, and you can, anytime there's a leak, a sound wave will come off and we'll travel along the pipe and you can measure when that sound wave comes and you can actually pinpoint where those leaks are. Um, you can get certain certain levels, doesn't work great in plastic pipes, works great in metal pipes because in, in metal pipes you get the vibrations, in plastic pipes you get a lot less noise. Depends on the size of the leak. Um, Montreal has a huge problem, their, their loss is around 40% in their, in their distribution systems. We use unaccountable water. Ideally, you'd like to get it around 20%. I'm just wondering, in an old network, when you change 1%, what would happen to the remaining network? Like, would it be affected because of the new pipe? Yeah, I mean, anytime you do something, there's sometimes a cause. Anytime there's a water main break, you'll get dirty water slugs that go around your event. We did rehab. Uh, City of Waterloo's got a lot of old cast iron pipes in the center core that are unlined. So we did a lining program. Um, however, that moved the problem some other places. These are very complex systems trying to figure out how they perform. No, I'm just asking, like, the flow of water will increase in the new one? Yeah. So it will affect the old connected one? Well, you have to make the assessment. Is that pipe? strong enough to continue the pressures? Do I just need a coating on the inside, which would be a cement to improve water quality? Does it have structural capacity? Then you can go to a cheaper solution. If the pipe is corroded and has deterioration pockets and doesn't have a long-term life of 20 or 30 years, then you put a new build new one. Yeah. will be better than the old, but then you're only as usually as strong as the other connections. Yeah. Um, very, it does not increase your brake frequency. So it, but it does improve. And you have to build capital work programs, especially when you're using new technologies. You have to make the projects big enough that people will do it. You don't pave little tiny sections of the road. You make big, long pavement sections because it's more, you get better bang for your buck. So you need to, you need to develop long-term um, capital works programs for these companies if you want to get a better bang for your buck. Big, big thing is, just like any problem, you have to, under, you have to find, understand what the problem is and find the right solution. You don't take a solution and put it onto a problem. Agreed? Yeah. Um, I'd be curious to know how the effect is. In Montreal, you go there, I mean, there's a lot more bridge deterioration is deteriorating, the water pipelines are like giant sprinklers. Um, you know, stuff collapses and fails all over the place. At least 100 people die every day because of bridge failures. Exaggerating. But, you know, no, I, yeah. I think you get there and you get corruption creating the system. Yeah. How would you deal with that in this context here? Well, I'm so one of the. Lead out cash out of everything. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, economics usually rules. Um, when you look at trenchless technologies, open cut contractors, which is a lot of them, have a big lobby group. They don't want to use 
trenchless technologies because you're cutting their profits. However, at the end of the day, when people realize the size of the problem and the works that they have to have and the rates, that will typically drive and push out some of those other ones. So it's part of an education process and, and, um, and the economics to drive it. It's not, yeah, it's not an easy solution. And you have to, so um, many municipalities are, let Mikey try it first, prove it. They're very conservative. Other municipalities are, um, Waterloo has always been very progressive. They said, let's try it. If it works one time out of 10, we'll consider it a success. Right? Other people will say, we won't try it until someone else has totally proved it and it's 100% safe for spending public money. Right choices. What's the cost of the water main break on average? Like that picture that you showed there, you know, that, that, that car there that was in the water. I mean, there's legal, legal liability there, people could have gotten hurt, there's a lot of damage done to other infrastructure, the erosion and all that. The price of a water main you break. Yeah, you, it, it's here. It's somewhere around $6,000 of repair. 6000 Yeah. That's it? Depending on the size of the break. Depends if there's any other damages. There was a water main break um, in Hamilton in January where they couldn't, you know the one I'm talking about? Where they couldn't get it shut off. They went and they never, they never you should, you're supposed to exercise the valves every year, the shut off valves. They hadn't done that. So this water main broke downtown, it was the coldest time of year. Water spilling on the street, what happened? It froze. And they tried to shut off the system to close the valves, and they couldn't shut them off, so they kept on going back, shutting off valves. But eventually it would have shut off anyways because they drained the reservoirs of, of water. So it was almost close, it was like six or seven hours before they finally got the water shut off. Now what's, what's the cost? cost to the insurance companies and all that stuff was huge. So, but the economic cost, typically for a water main, is somewhere around, I think, $6,000 $6, to repair it. This website uses, there was a study by NRC that uh, used it, and I, was, I thought it was, according to the price tags, is blank. I don't know why it's blank, right? But there is, a, there is information on here, and they basically just take this number, multiply it by the $6,500, and get a total cost for this this clock of corrosion. Yeah, that's just corrosion too. Like the other costs. Yeah. Social cost, environmental cost, and how do you put all that stuff in? Any other questions? We have great drinking water systems. Believe it or not, Canada is on the pioneering side of, of a lot of this stuff. We're way ahead of the U.S. Our water utilities are five to ten years ahead of the water utilities in the U.S. We think we got a problem, their problem's ten to a hundred times bigger than ours. But there's huge opportunities to take this technology and drive it into the U.S. as well. Yeah? One last question. How long do you think it'll be before we get into like membrane type filtration of water? I realize you're looking at the infrastructure and piping. I'm not a, I'm not on the treatment side I'm on the distribution side but let's ask this question what's the design paradigm for our drinking water systems today fire flows we've got this old deteriorated system and what are we doing we're treating all the water in those pipes to put out fires. So we've got this high quality water that's pumped out to put out fires, to wash your car, to, 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 to water your gardens. How much of that water do we need for drinking? 5%? What's the cost of us treating all that water to that level for something that we don't use? Let's go to the other side. Let's go to conservation side. We can fix our pipes, take out all the infiltration, all the extra flow, and if we go to low flush toilets and we use conservation to the extreme, and we flush our toilet, there will be no water to carry the stuff down to the treatment plant on the other end. Because our pipes are designed way too big associated with it. 
So if we go to the extremes, our water and wastewater treatment plants don't work. And if we go through the cost of building water and treatment plants, and some of the stuff that we showed, that these interconnections, we don't need to build big massive water treatment plants and big massive wastewater treatment plants because we can take out all that stuff if we build, spend the money fixing the infrastructure on the, on, on the distribution side. So there has to be a whole design paradigm shift and policy shift with respect to people. But it's going to cost money. Our water rates are going to go up. Have to. We pay way too little. We pay nothing for water. But as energy costs go up, disinfection costs go up. So the thing I start to promote is why not build a new drinking water system? Small diameter drinking water system. Come to the house. Well, kind of. We'll make it a pressurized system that has a proper flow so we don't have to treat. And we'll turn our old pipes into our fire flowing pipes. Who cares if they leak a little bit? Right? But it's gray water. But then you've got a huge cost associated with trying to do this. That's a kind of a mind bend with respect to people. And we can repair. I can repair those old drinking, wa or the old drinking water system pipes for fire flows at a fraction of the cost. I don't have to meet NSF 61 drinking water qualities. I don't have to put out temporary bypassing. I don't have to do all these things. I can fix that at a fraction of the cost to make it a great water system versus a drinking water system. So there's all kinds of things that need to be changed in thought and process. New technologies are going to come in. Maybe we'll figure out a way that we don't need to drink water at the house. And maybe we don't need toilets as a waste receptor. Yeah, composting toilets, but we still, doesn't matter. We still need water for dishes. We still need all this stuff. We still need to push this stuff out and it magically disappears. The beautiful thing is these pipes and the system has worked extremely well for a long period of time. And it will work. We can not do anything tomorrow and they're not going to fail. But it's going to cost. Some, somewhere you've got to pay for it. Thank you very much.